Welcome everybody. This is my honor today that I will introduce you the, the lecture of the day. And by the way, it's a, a very important lecture because we never talk about in depth about the economic populism, because of course, in other contexts it came up several times, but it's, it looked as a, let's say a marginal uh, field of uh, the populism. But uh, today our lecturer will introduce us into the area of economic populism. And I'm really honored to introduce you, Bela Greskovic, who is a university professor at the Department of International Relations and Department of Political Science at the Central European University. Uh, Bela has uh, got his M uh, MA at the Budapest University of Economics, and he, he got the PhD in 19, uh, 1996 at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences by the Economic Committee. He is a professor since 2001 at the CEU in this, depart in, in this department. And uh, uh, previously, I just shortly mentioned some information about his career uh, because there were some important uh, visiting in his, uh, his, his life. Um, by the way, uh, 1988 and uh, 1992, he was, he was a head of research department and senior researcher at the Copping Data Institute of, for Economic and Market Research and Informatics. This was a very, very important and successful um, organization and uh, he played an important role, you know, to the scientific foundation of the transition. He was an economic uh, freedom fellow at Georgetown University in 1992 in uh, Washington, uh, D.C. And he was an associated fellow in the Collegium Budapest Institute for Advanced Studies between 1997 and 1998. And he was also a Luigi Einaud professor between 1998 and 1999 at the Cor Cornell University at the Institute of European Studies in Ithaca. And he was a visiting professor in 2003, between 2003 and 2004 at the Harvard University and a visiting fellow between 2008 and 2009 at the European U University Institute Florence. Uh, Mila Greskovic's research interest is primarily focused on political and social impact of leading transitional industries in Eastern Europe, politics of enlargement of the Eurozone, democratization, South American and Eastern European politics and economic development, economic ideologies, politics of policy making. Uh, I just pick up some of his publications because I checked it as a kind of uh, academic database and it shows how many publications the academics um, could achieve. And he has uh, 127 publications. He wrote 14 books in foreign languages and uh, 31, 31 articles from the 56. So dominantly he is publishing in, uh, in foreign language primary in, in English. He has uh, two monographs, the political economy of protest and patience, Eastern European Latin American transformation compared. This was published at the uh, CEU press in 1998. And probably his major book is Capitalist Diversity on Europe's Periphery, which was uh, public, published at the Cornell University Press in 2012, and there was a co-author of this book, Dorothy Ball. His article appears in several, several journals and uh, uh, academic um, parts. Um, let's see, just to mention some labor history, Western European politics, competition and change, Journal of Democracy, European Journal of Sociology, and so far. He has uh, awards, 
One was the very prestigious Stein Rockham Prize for Comparative Social Research uh, that he got in 2013. And he was in 2014 the winner of the uh, award for outstanding, outstanding research it, for the book, what actually what he wrote with uh, Dorothy Ball. And also he got in 2014 the Bibo Istvan Prize of the Hungarian Political Science Association. He has several membership, major associations, and a very important role he plays in these um, associations. And he also has a, a member of several editorial boards. I don't list them because there are uh, so many. So visibly, Bela Grzeszkowicz has a very successful career in the field of economy, political economy, economy. And uh, what we asked from him when we were designing the seminar to introduce us to the nature of the problem of economic populism. So that is the title, Neoliberalism and Economic Populism. So and we are really happy that Bela accepted our invitation and joined us. And uh, I give the floor to Bela. And uh, as usually, he has 45, 60 minutes to give his lecture. And then the next hour is open for a free discussion. So welcome you. And that's, I give the floor to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Antal, for this very, very kind and uh, detailed introduction and uh, I am really happy uh, to discuss a couple of ideas uh, with you. I was uh, preparing actually quite a bit for this lecture. Uh, you gave me a very difficult uh, topic because uh, both neoliberalism and economic populism are used in uh, very, very diverse meanings. Uh, and both are used by as bad words by scholars, pundits, and political figures of the opposite camp, right? So I try to make some order here. I try to do my best, uh, basically focusing uh, on the region that I know best, which is Central Eastern Europe. But then I also want to make certain uh, um, claims uh, for a more general interest uh, in this subject. So let me just uh, share uh, the screen. I, I prepared a PowerPoint presentation so that you can easier follow uh, my uh, presentation. Let me share it. Uh, so this is the title, Neoliberalism and Populism in East Central Europe. I, actually uh, took seriously uh, the, the, the task uh, that I was uh, uh, given. And I, I have the following plan. So basically, this is the, the lecture. I want to do three things. One is to uh, present and compare two debates on the nexus neoliberalism and economic populism. Uh, everybody knows that this nexus nowadays is heavily debated in the 2000s, but probably fewer people know that during the first decade of the post-communist transformation in East Central Europe, there was already a debate on the nexus between economic neoliberalism and what is what was called that time the populism and that debate was actually imported in eastern europe into eastern europe from the latin american debates of the 80s uh, so i will introduce these debates by the main rival views uh, that were presented the differences and similarities and also will point to certain blind spots. And then reflecting to these blind spots, I actually will offer you a Hungarian case study, uh, which is an empirical case study 
uh, about the country having left and liberals, neoliberals in terms of economic uh, policy and philosophy in power in 2002, 2010, and economic populists uh, in opposition. And then from 2010, we have an asymmetric setup. Uh, we have uh, what is called economic populists and pop right-wing populists more generally in power uh, in a very, very successful pro political project uh, for 12 years now. Uh, and neoliberalism partly disappearing, partly opposition together with the left. And then I try to uh, do some, uh, draw some comparative uh, lessons and also ask for comparative research uh, on East Central Europe and probably beyond. But you guys will see how far, what, what my story that I uh, can tell uh, reflects some of your experiences and some of your knowledge. Uh, from other countries. So let me start. So basically, I want to start uh, with two working, with working missions uh, of both neoliberalism and economic populism based on the Latin American experience of the, 19th, uh, of the 1970s and 80s. So neoliberalism, uh, in terms of its growth model, is defined by an effort through achieve, to achieve growth through global market integration and institutionalizing neoliberal economic policy and philosophy internationally, among others in the World Bank, in what is called the Washington Consensus of Polyforms, uh, to increase the role of the uh, market and decrease the role of the state in the economy, the IMF. Economic populism, in contrast, imagines growth, expects growth from expansion on sheltered home markets. The next, the social bloc that in this ideal type would support neoliberalism, would be foreign capital, exporters, and upper middle class individuals. The counter block, the economic populist block would be national capital, organized workers, which in Latin America and uh, other developing countries basically represent a minor part, but very vocal working class and lower middle classes. Now the policies could not differ more either. In the case of neoliberalism, these are typically foreign market, foreign trade and domestic market liberalization, privatization, including privatization of public services, deregulation of markets, and economic stabilization, namely trying to avoid foreign debt and control inflation on the domestic markets. Now, again, the contrast with economic populism is large. Economic populists believe in trade protectionist, protected national markets finance through foreign debt, not by chance, these are typically where economic populism happens were typically developing countries, uh, but also financed by inflation spending, renationalization uh, of nationalization or renationalization of certain parts of the economy. Now the welfare model, that's the last aspect of the def definition. It's basically trickled down economics for neoliberalism, which basically means that you don't redistribute, you avoid redistribution and maintaining social welfare through redistributive welfare states. What you expect is 
to lift the burdens of taxation uh, from the rich, you expect that then they will invest, they will invest that creates labor, uh, jobs for workers, then this trickle down economist, economics basic uh, results in a growth of national uh, wealth, of, of welfare at national level. Now, economic populism, however, as it was implemented in Latin America, uh, banked on redistributive, limited welfare states for those social groups which it targeted. So this would be the, the working definition. I will tell them later how this or not today. Now, the early debate, the early 90s debate on the populist danger, as I told you, this was imported uh, to the transforming East Central Europe from the earlier experiences uh, uh, made in Latin America and other parts of uh, developing countries. Uh, not by chance, of course, because many of the advisors, the economic advisors, <clears throat> advised Latin American uh, governments, often dictatorships, to fix the economy uh, and turn and, and make a, a market-oriented turn were the same in East Central Europe. So these were basically traveling money doctors, so to say, <clears throat> with knowing very little about individual regions, but knowing uh, more <clears throat> the of the economic policy strategy that they uh, recommended. So the logic of the main debate was, so the rival views, the neoliberal advisors, uh, the pundits, liberal pundits, uh, liberal politicians in East Central Europe basically believed in a model where all good things go hand. Namely, the economic model that was most conducive in their view to economic growth they believed also creates the best economic conditions, namely high growth and limited inequality for democracy. So introduce radical economic reforms, you will end up with uh, high growth and political democracy. There was a, a, a polar opposite view represented by critics uh, of neoliberal transformation, both Western and peripheral critics, uh, meaning uh, staying in East Central Europe, which argued the opposite, namely that the danger to political liberalism comes precisely from the reliance to on economic liberalism. This is an idea where basically all bad things go hand in hand, not all good things, but all bad things. And the logic is that radical transformation creates inequality. Uh, in order to control inequality, uh, the democratic uh, inclusion of losers is unwanted. However, People excluded and suffering from uh, the radical transformation strategy through marginalization, social disparity, will be uh, tempted and fall prey to xenophobic uh, nationalist demagogues. So basically, left neoliberal utopias were contrasted with left liberal dystopia. Let's, let's call it. Now, the trigger of the populist backlash uh, was different in both cases. Piecemeal transformation for the neoliberals who told if reforms are gradual, they give time and space for the forces of populists to regroup their forces and they will de derail the whole political and economic transformation policy. As a, the radical transformation was seen, the main trigger of a populist backlash in the left liberal critics 
of neoliberals. Now, the forces of populism were seen among labor, organized labor in East Central Europe, management of state-owned enterprises, and communist, cynical communist political entrepreneurs changing their colors from red to brown. Uh, in the view of the uh, critics of the neoliberal transition strategy, uh, labor abandoned by liberals uh, could be seduced by illiberal identity entrepreneurs. So there was a lot of sort of soul searching in the left liberal camp about uh, betraying the workers, which is present pretty well. I will tell a little bit about that. And then the last thing, the populist mindset. So neoliberals saw the populists as not understanding a thing about how the economy works, uh, what takes what, no idea about logical connections. So there was a, co a, a cognitive problem that was attributed to those who became followers of uh, populist uh, political projects. And then uh, for the, in this actually, interestingly, the, the critics agreed uh, with the neoliberals because they told that workers should be class conscious, but since they are excluded, they will basically follow nationalists and xenophobics, which was called and termed as false consciousness, right? So there was a, would have been a right consciousness, but this was false consciousness. Why? Because of the left liberal betrayer. Okay, now, what did I find? I was involved in this debate and, and, and I, had, I, I made uh, some marginal impact uh, with some iconoclastic views. Uh, so the main finding was that in East Central Europe, Latin American type of ec economic populist experiments failed to materialize partly because these countries were uh, in a very um, difficult economic situation uh, right after the collapse of communism, there was crisis, there was indebtedness, very high dependence on Western capital. So populists could not even promise very short term uh, gains, economic gains, uh, so remedies for social disparity for their followers. So this was one uh, reason. Uh, but then the interesting story is that actually it is not just that populism did not materialize in economic terms because it was um, uh, meeting international and domestic constraints. It was also because at a closer look, populist programs, economic populist programs in pure form hardly even existed. So parties that were called and social movements that were called populists basically represented some other versions and mixed versions of capitalism. They were against banks, but not against manufacturing investment. They were against, cap were against foreign capital, but not so much national capital. They wanted to join the EU, but under more balanced terms uh, than what they saw uh, was in the making. So, but this then of course uh, raises the issue about the blind spots. So the main blind debate was the supply side of populist politics. What was the populist program as it existed in real life? How did populists organize themselves on the ground, at the grassroots, but also in hierarchical organizations? And the reason I found was, and I still stand by my finding, that uh, there was a limited uh, attention uh, uh, who populists actually were 
because the main issue was not to study populism and understand populism, but basically exchange uh, contrary views, contrasting views. Um, the, by juxtaposing the neoliberal utopia with its populist, let's call it pathology. So neoliberals basically um, use the populist threat uh, to express their views about how economic transition and political transition ought to happen in East Central Europe. So therefore, possible combinations between neoliberalism and economic populism were also out of sight in this kind of debate. Okay, let's now turn to the next debate, the 2010, 10s, after the global financial crisis and uh, the Great Recession. So uh, there was, of course, and we are now part of it, a debate again, uh, which I would call the populist double attack uh, on liberalism. Uh, and I will tell a, a word about what I mean by that, which again is imported to the backsliding East Central Europe. Now, what's the difference here? There are several differences. First of all, the first debate was a peripheral debate. Uh, the debate of the early 90s affected peripheral countries. Uh, before that, Latin America, then East Central Europe. Now we are in a different situation. Everybody got interested in uh, neoliberalism and its discontents. Why? Because we have had uh, President Trump in the United States and we had Brexit and we had other countries such as Italy uh, and <clears throat> France where populists made headlines and, uh, and important uh, political uh, achievements. Uh, I mean, the, the, the next issue is, which is not by chance, you remember that the rival views in the first debate were between neoliberals and their left liberal critics. Neoliberalism in the second debate is not on the scene. At least I don't see it. It's not really presenting a utopia. It seems to be an intellectual recession without producing new visions. Almost, I would say, whereas populism is often characterized and ideology, almost, I would say, neoliberalism is somewhat similar in this respect. Now, the, the big debate is then uh, not between a neo neoliberal utopia and a critical dystopia, but basically the debate between various left liberal dystopias in which people most often discuss whether what we have seen uh, in a large number of countries in the world, including uh, the US, Britain, uh, India, but also East Central Europe, Hungary, the main reason is ec economic insecurity or a cultural backlash against the silent revolution uh, of uh, uh, capitalism, of Western capitalism, um, and or any combination of this. So this is, this is very much uh, debated. So the main debate is now within the critical camp. Uh, the trigger of ascendant populism, I mean, neoliberals don't really have to tell much about this either. So either they call the abandoned road, the famous term of Hayek, once you make a wrong step, uh, capitalism basically turns into a socialist dictatorship and worse. Uh, or what I heard from David Ransiman, who gave a very interesting spirited lecture at CEU uh, in, in Budapest, who told populism is the liberal's conspiracy theory. So there are all kinds of conspiracy theories discussed. Uh, Ransiman thinks liberals have a conspiracy theory to populism. Uh, for the critical camp, 
the trigger of ascendant populism is still radical economic transformation, liberal transformation, excluding the losers. Now the forces of populism uh, in the neoliberal camp, still the same, ignorant electorates fooled by cynical politicians. Now uh, for the opposite camp, old white male labor squeezed both as a class by economic insecurity, by grain and this group, by women, by ethnic minorities, by lifestyle groups and so on and so forth. And the populist mindset had not changed, but still a cognitive problem for the neoliberals, still shaped by false consciousness by the others. Now, as I told, the, the interesting story here and much time with these citations, but I found it very interesting that liberalism, and this, this is what I call the, the, the double attack, which is somewhat ironic because it is both attacked and often by the same people as agent of economic dispossession, but also as an agent that tries to emancipate tries to equalize because it emancipates, em tries to emancipate the wrong actors, women against men, uh, ethnic minorities uh, against the major, migrants uh, against the locals. It's all wrong because it undermines the cohesion of traditional societies. Now we have almost parallel views expressed in 2017 and later in the United States and Hungary, where George Soros was both uh, and, and what he represents, the global power structure is both as undermining uh, uh, the working class, uh, stripping uh, the country or trying to do that of its wealth, put the money into the pockets of a handful of large corporations and so on. And for uh, forcing uh, on countries and populations with different values, political correctness, which is basically uh, an umbrella term for what I call the emancipatory experiences. So, Nowadays, liberalism has a hard time to do anything good. When it, uh, it acts in the economy, it dispossesses. When it acts in politics, it emancipates the wrong agents. Okay. Uh, and then nine spot, there is something very interesting. Still the supply side. So much less research is known about the kind of uh, communities, identity communities that are characteristic to the parties and social movements, which are called populist, let's call it like that. Uh, what does it mean in terms of their ideologies, their uh, grassroots organizations and networks, the hierarchical organizations. So what are actually the social forces that creates from a large number of individuals who vote for the populists, quote and quote, actually, what keeps them together? And this is especially interesting if we have populists in power for 12 years plus, who knows, uh, where you have to understand a little bit what else than the repressive methods used by them keeps them in power. Is there a social base uh, to uh, these parties or not? Now, so that is still a blind spot. And, uh, and for me, this is, of course, one of the fascinating research projects that I try to pursue. So well, this is not a blind spot for Viktor Orban. You see the young man there, one of the young men there is Viktor Orban, 
uh, he was in, in uh, 1989, uh, where he was still influenced by another young man who is uh, in the background, Antonio, the hegemonic theory of Antonio Gramsci. So Viktor Orban, he is the Hungarian uh, premier uh, for about uh, 12 years now. Um, in, uh, in 12 consecutive years. Uh, interestingly, he wrote his MA thesis, which he submitted to the ELTE uh, on Polish solidarity and how solidarity built civil, built civil society. Uh, and in this work, he quoted uh, sociologists like Antonio Gramsci, generously, Alan Turin, and many others. So for Orban Victor, uh, the supply side was always in the focus of his interest. So I just have here a couple of citations by him. While liberals are preoccupied with, by freedom, unconstrained by uh, moral principles, and socialists are preoccupied with modern in strict material sense, the civic forces, his political camp, this community. Then he wrote again uh, later, uh, I want to approach the problem of nation, the economy and society in labels, which in, in, in ways we challenge the labels like nationalism, anti-market and populism, right? Uh, and then uh, the last uh, quotation which I have here, which he gave actually at the at the Congress of a, 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 an organization of Christian uh, intellectuals, when he remembers his time in opposition, uh, visiting the country uh, and talking to various people, typically on the social Christian conservative right, and also quote unquote, ordinary people. And he attributes to these visits and the organization, which I will immediately uh, introduce for you, uh, the outcome that what he said, currently, this is, this is due to, or this resulted in the current situation when the social hinterland, or he says in socialist parlance, embeddedness, of the national and civic right is much more robust than that of our rivals. So he attributes partly his resilience in power to the civil society base uh, that he has. So the argument of the Hungarian, the first part of the Hungarian study is that the rise and resilience of the Hungarian right is partly due to uh, its superior embeddedness in civil society, which was achieved uh, in 2002-2010 when uh, uh, the right was in opposition, eight years in opposition, uh, by mainly by a movement uh, which was founded by Viktor Orban in 2002, the Civic Circles Movement, which integrated and mobilized initially all fractions of the right from the conservatives uh, to the radical right and parts of the civil society base of old and new left, including environmental movements, including anti-war movements. Uh, th this uh, civic circle movement uh, that time was strongly against the Iraq war, for instance. Uh, and even some trade unions. Just to tell you in very few words what this big circles movement, it was militant uh, because of its hegemonic aspirations and collective practices. They organized a large number of protests. Uh, by the way, what I am talking about is empirical findings based on a database of about 5,000 events uh, I collected, uh, organized by uh, the Civic Circle Movement uh, 2002 and 2006. So what I am telling here is about, I don't want to 
uh, bore you very much with the details and, and numbers, but this is the basis of, of my uh, characterization. So it was militant uh, in terms of its hegemonic aspirations and collective practices. It was massive in its membership and activities. We are talking about 5,000 events uh, in Hungary as well as in the neighboring countries with uh, ethnic Hungarian minorities. The membership uh, could be above 100,000, which approximates the combined membership of this uh, of the of all the Hungarian parties that time, and is about one third of the membership of trade unions, dominantly metropolitan and urban, but also transborder. So most of these people, the members of the, in the civic circles themselves, were partly active in the capital and partly in the bigger or medium-sized Hungarian towns of the countryside and educated middle class based in terms of social uh, stratification. Uh, we are talking here about social conservative teachers, doctors, lawyers, media pundits, and entrepreneurs. But there was two defining group here. The Christian national cultural bourgeoisie, Bildungsbürgertum, the educated, uh, middle class and the native economic petty bourgeoisie, the small size entrepreneurs. And in the last part of the lecture, I will focus on this letter or the, the coming part, the, the national native economic petty bourgeoisie. Uh, so <clears throat> who were these national petty bourgeois who were attracted by the movement? They were basically small and medium scale entrepreneurs and artisans, which found some sort of attachment to the nation's land, labor, culture, through activities mainly sectorally concentrated in agriculture, land, of course, farmers, we are talking about, winemaking. Most Hungarian winemakers are right-wing and uh, uh, conne were connected this time to the civic circus movement. Production and retail of authentic food, tourism, transport and hospitality. Tourism meant mainly tourism enterprises and hospitality chains, uh, basically uh, uh, organizing visits to the Hungarian ethnically Hungarian populated parts of the neighboring countries, plus publishing and local media. Uh, what did they do? So they organized essence, they organized think tanks, domestic production and retail chains, transborder ethnic networks. This is what I mentioned, managing pilgrimage tourism. So what you should imagine is trips, were organized for civic circle members by transport means driven by uh, drivers belonging to the civic circles and then basically uh, hosted by uh, uh, restaurants, businesses, small hotels uh, in the neighboring countries uh, and were presented uh, all kinds of cultural events uh, uh, of, uh, of the former uh, Greater Hungarian, so-called Greater Hungarian areas. So this was not really just tourism. Uh, this was a tourism where people not belonging to that cultural circles would feel strange. Uh, it had a sacred uh, character. The next is they invented national brands and advertisements, slogan, slogans, solidaristic uh, charity projects, theme schemes also for transborder charity, uh, and a survival for the survival of the ethnic cultural nation 
uh, cross trade orders. And then, of course, they were protesting against transnational corporations' expansion, European Union regulations, and austerity. Now, next. How did they internalize labor? So this happened basically uh, two ways, uh, through self-education, in visions of what religion, what civicness means, what the nation means, uh, and what Europe means. Uh, manuals for the civic circles uh, produced by the civic circles were circulated. I show here one. The title is Recapturing Everyday Life and the Holidays. You realize the ambition here, right? An entire shift and an entire uh, conquest. <laughs> the holidays, uh, the everyday habits, the networks, the heroes, the symbols for the Hungarian right. This is just one of the manuals that was circulated among, among the civic circles. And then develop the other way in which they internalized who they were. They were developing ideas and practices of what uh, Richard Swedberg in a very interesting article uh, calls national folk economics, which is economics that might have not much to do with uh, what economic science tells about things, but has an impact because people partly experience it through their own life experience and partly they get it from sources that they consider reliable. So nationalist folk economics, if you want to call it populism, call it. I, I think it's, it's a nicer term to use it, folk economics, was another way uh, through which people created their communities. Okay, I just show you a couple of pictures uh, and I will not explain them all. There was a rich symbolics here. So the varieties of nationalist folk economics included. What you see here um, is a Hungarian authentic food uh, and wine shop with the advertisement by Hungarian so that you will have your earning tomorrow, which is a naive way of expressing that if you consume Hungarian stuff, Hungarian entrepreneurs will employ Hungarian workers. So the working class through its wages is considered as a consumption uh, group uh, for the national products. So sort of uh, an autonomous model, which of course doesn't work like this in reality, but this was the kind of Mm, uh, touch to, uh, to, to the folk imagination. Of course, then you have the, on the other side, you have a, a Hungarian brand name, which was part also of the civic circle, entrepreneurial movement combined with bio uh, uh, production. So basically you see a highly nationalist version, but also probably innocently nationalist version of the farmer market right the farmers market the product and the, and the and the healthy hungarian food uh, is of course also good for the nation now of course you see uh, radical uh, symbolics as well coming close to anti-semitic uh, uh, i would say all, only also interwar fascist uh, uh, symbolics where the Illuminati uh, grab uh, with their hands the whole globe. And of course, you know who, uh, who is meant there. And then you have also still uh, another uh, potential um, way of thinking about nationalist folk economics in which this is extended to the whole area of Greater Hungary. Um, okay, now I come to the Hungarian second part of the Hungarian case study where populists, quote unquote, are in power. Now, the civic circles, which lost their significance, their political significance by 2010, uh, and are not there in their earlier form, but they are there as some sort of social capital. 
that doesn't really disappear. It changes forms, but uh, it doesn't really disappear. So the civic circles, and I have lots of uh, proof for this, they themselves as hotbeds of what can be called a prefigurative politics of what came after. So they thought they were experimenting with how Hungary will look and the Hungarian economy will look once the right is in power. Now, relative to this imagination, the Orban regime uh, in its real mm, shape and gestalt proved to be pretty genus fair because it is merging noisy policies and politics of a populist structure with quiet policies and quiet politics of neoliberal continuity. And the part of the mixture, uh, part, part of the justification for, for this mix mixture might lie in basically it's a winning formula, formula for mobilist and in consent internally and satisfy veto players, in this case, basically German manufacturing corporations, uh, German, the German government and the European Union externally. It means rebalancing economic nationalism with neoliberalism and welfare protection for the haves with workfare for the have-nots. It also means diversifying without ending uh, actually dependency. Now I want to show you a few, just a few data and I, I just uh, summarize them briefly. There can be more data presented uh, in, in, in uh, defense of this, uh, in support of this thesis. So in no sharp break with what could be called or what we called uh, in my work with Dorothy Bulle embedded in neoliberalism, which is basically market oriented uh, growth models combined with uh, socially sensitive, F, relatively sensitive welfare states. There is no sharp break on each or on any of these uh, uh, dimensions. The economic freedom, yes, uh, measured by uh, uh, international institutions, uh, right-wing think tanks. Uh, yes, it declined relative to where it was uh, in, uh, the, in, in Hungary um, uh, after Viktor Orban came to power, but it's still close to the European, to the average of the 10 uh, East European member states of the European Union level. Uh, it's close to Poland. Uh, so these are still economically pretty neoliberal countries. Now, public welfare spending, yes, it declined in Hungary and it is on continuous decline. You will learn about uh, this in the coming lecture by, by uh, Dorotya Sikra, who is a, a splendid uh, expert of welfare policies under populism. But still, Hungary is relative to the region, the low spender on public welfare. Um, the next issue, okay, the growth model. Again, you select cautious economic nationalism versus continuing European Union integration via foreign direct investment. So the noisy politics of combating foreign uh, direct investment dependency is coupled with the quiet politics of subsidizing mainly German manufacturing foreign direct investment. There is of course all kinds of uh, talk about bad and good foreign direct investment. Bad is that uh, which goes into finance uh, and, uh, and retail and good is uh, what is going to manufacturing. Uh, there, there, there have been attempts of taxing and nationalizing the banking sector, the retail and energy and media. But if you look at the data, the actual degree to which the Orban regime 
uh, vent in this nationalization drive is relatively, relatively uh, modest, uh, despite the fanfare around it. And I have to add here that uh, foreign uh, ownership and control over strategic sectors in Hungary has been extraordinary before 2010. And then, of course, there is a lot of investment into um, creating a national bourgeoisie, Hungarian property, uh, apparently employing Hungarian workers uh, under better conditions, will not happen, uh, for which the government gets a lot of criticism as a corrupt government. Now, here again, uh, of course, you know, it's my it's not my aim to to explain or defend here, defend here anything, but yes, uh, national bourgeoisies are often created, uh, especially in uh, small, uh, less developed countries, with, uh, but even originally in the current uh, hegemons of global capitalism, with partly murky corrupt businesses. Uh, the social model basically includes depletion, what we call depletion replenishment. Uh, so again, the noisy politics of fighting austerity and building a work-based society goes hand in hand with the quiet politics of offshore disinvestment, uh, except family policy, uh, about which you will learn uh, from uh, Dorotya Sikra. Uh, so what this means is that it is a consumption-oriented welfare state for the haves, mainly uh, employed middle-class young families uh, and um, workfare for the have uh, often ethnically poor, uh, which are employed and brought into the labor force, but not really back to the labor market by public works programs. This is mostly affecting the Roma population. Uh, at the same time, what we see is disinvestment from education and healthcare, which is highly disapproved by people who believe in social investment fair states. Uh, they say uh, the, the government uh, with this, uh, this way basically uh, uh, sells out the country's future. Now, here again, just to think a little bit about this situation, uh, of course, it is important to invest into healthcare and education. We see this uh, with the COVID uh, crisis and also uh, other uh, challenges. Uh, the problem here is again, which probably one should take a little bit more seriously is that uh, uh, free movement of labor within the European Union and the demand of Western welfare states for educated uh, workers, um, social work, uh, healthcare, education, and so might easily mean that by generous social investment, the peripheral country invests into the social investment welfare state of the core countries. Now, this is, of course, again, a, a very controversial issue uh, with which any government should fight. Uh, and then the last uh, slide here, and I have to conclude. So basically what I told buying time by diversifying rather than overcoming dependency means um, that uh, by uh, maintaining dependence on foreign direct investment, new sources that basically help the Orban regime and this kind of interesting mixed uh, economic policy strategy to survive is the EU's cohesion and structural funds and the remittances of migrant labor, an issue I just mentioned. Okay, and then I let me just take 
two more uh, minutes to conclude with my presentation. So there are some perhaps generalizable lessons uh, from my research, which are actually not similar to Sidas Kochpos and, um, and Williamson's 2016 book. I, by the way, enjoyed tremendously Sidas Kochpos' presentation in this series. I, I was watching it. The first is the agency of the right is important for the ascendance of the right. Now, this, this may sound as evident, but actually, uh, part of the liberal soul searching about who beat the white uh, manufacturing work, working class and how uh, seems to forget about that the right often works hard for its own ascendance. It's not only that the stage here is divided between a cynical political leader, the populist, and then the uneducated uh, following vote for him uh, for false consciousness or uh, cognitive problem. The second, the haves of human capital are as important for the rise of the right as the have nots. So we do see here, based on the Hungarian case, but I see uh, uh, proofs that th this is happening as well as well, a mobilization of social conservative, educated social groups. So it's not only a consciousness. Then the arena of civil society organizations and civic activism is no less important for the political breakthrough as the electoral arena. I think that most of the current research still focuses on electoral behaviors and electoral groups. It is also important to know more about the civic and civil organization, hierarchical or grassroots, and their ideas and their ways of uh, interacting with their members to produce more durable coalitions than what you can just expect when you see uh, an electoral protest group or an electoral um, uh, coalition. And then the last is, uh, which I tried to prove in the previous part, a copula on the headlines combines fairly well with neoliberalism in the subtext and the mix may contribute to regime resilience. And with this, I just offer some more food for thought, like where I want to take this research is a comparative direction. So what the question that really uh, interests me is, so based on what I find in hunger, what's the situation? So do all populism or uh, uh, contexts which are called populists have similar robust social foundations, but we just don't seem to see them because we have the blinders or the populism research has uh, the blinders that does not allow to go research to the, that direction. Or is it alternatively the case that there are popular quote unquote which are characterized by deep social embeddedness and others which are shallow in terms of social uh, embedding. And if so, how to explain the variety? And then of course, a basic uh, problem for which I am not a populism researcher. I don't like to use this term. I, I really use it just because I, you know, I got the task and I found it fascinating. Uh, how far is the populist notion capable of capturing the diversity and complexity at hand? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And now the floor is open uh, to ask questions or to comment. And though oh, there is already, we have one. Andras Oroto would like to um, say something. So, Andras, I give the floor to you. 
Okay, so of course it's a wonderful presentation, which is what we expected on the basis of your written work, because I think that uh, political economy of protest and patience is really a major work. And it's something that everybody who studies these topics, not just populism, but also contemporary forms of authoritarianism should really read the book. Now, it, it, I think the people now re realize you're an economist by training and that book is marked still very much by the point of view of the economist. Uh, what uh, I recommend though, is that people read the, uh, at least the article, you're writing a book, but the article on the civic circles, which presents in more detail what the part you presented just now. Uh, although, of course, written before the Orban regime proper was consolidated. So uh, that is another chapter, of course, that you would have to deal with. Now, looking at all this work, which I have taken seriously and have integrated also in our own work with uh, Eugene Cohen, uh, what uh, I uh, noticed uh, and you, of course, uh, have some trouble with using the term populism as the central category here, but still, with respect to that category, you have shifted. Uh, and even though you have indicated uh, the two epochs of discussion, in a way, your book is in the first epoch of discussion. It's very much in the first epoch, and it is defined by that debate. Uh, uh, which sees populism as a menace from the point of view of the logic of the transition. And uh, you yourself uh, uh, probably as a citizen participated in that debate in a normative way. And of course, you try to present it in a more value-free form, but, but obviously you were on that side, which considered that to be a, a potential danger for what you were all doing. I think the whole Hungarian economics profession was doing it. So I'm not going to... <laughs> I'm not going too far if, if I would say that, uh, that uh, you're all in, in that, uh, that together. And so the definition of populism was very much uh, based on Latin America's past. In the book, it's interesting how Fujimori appears only once or twice, Menem in a very weird way, Uribe, so that Latin American populism isn't only what you're describing is, is, is sort of glanced at, but it is not said, it is still Peron uh, who is cited in the most important places. So populism is defined in, in, in those terms. Okay, so that's Bela one, Bela Greshkovich one. So now we have Bela Greshkovich two, uh, who holds on to one conclusion of that book which is that in, our, in, the demand, in the period of neoliberal hegemony, which is still not entirely over, although it is cracking, uh, uh, the only viable populism is one that integrates it. That was the prediction. And you, in that sense, uh, the fact that uh, Uribe and uh, Fujimori and so on are not so mentioned is not a big flaw because your prediction incorporates them in a way, right? So you predict really what you just said about Orban, that neoliberalism will be integrated. In this sense, you don't have to do any mea culpas. Uh, as an advisor, perhaps you do have to do some mea culpas, but not as an, not as an analyst, because you kind of uh, uh, make this, uh, uh, this uh, you make the, the right prediction with respect to that. Nevertheless, even as you made the right prediction, you now are discussing populism as uh, fueled by the dynamics of civil society. Now, my heart is close to this interpretation, of course, I'm not an economist. And so in a way, Gene and I will, will ride with that particular thesis. But nevertheless, the bridge between uh, Bila Greshkovich I and Bila Greshkovich II is a difficult one. Uh, and you suggest in the book, that there could be an electoral bridge, but now you de-emphasize it. So now you create a civil society bridge, but you yourself see that that's not universal. Lots of places uh, already in power uh, that some kind of mobilization from above is promoted. So this scenario, Orban is very strange, right? Because he loses power 2002, and then he begins to kind of from above, because he's still the ex-prime minister, mobilized. 
but still it is a movement from below and you described it today very much as a civil society movement from below bringing together all the various movements exciting I find it's really interesting by the way a very very interesting I think you're the only one who has done this and it's remarkable and nevertheless it, it just doesn't fully serve as a as a bridge and then indeed Orban wins an election again and that election can be explained otherwise than looking at the civic circles and then the civil circles are demobilized anyway so in a way uh, you have gone to a concept of populism uh, that, uh, that 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 doesn't really uh, doesn't really explain how uh, 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 how such a thing in general is possible and if it were only hungry that would be a small matter but you know, in this course, we have looked at so many cases and we see that that relationship, and you say this at the end. So, so in a way, the question of what is populism? And I would suggest that the mistake is that, uh, and I think it's not a mistake, it was a professional bias of yours, that you start with the economic. You know, today's literature starts with the political. It starts with the political. Almost everybody, all the major authors define it as some kind of political phenomena, discursive, uh, uh, ideological, uh, uh, maybe uh, strategic, but again, strategic in a political sense. So everybody talks now about populism as a political. And you yourself went from the economic to the civil, but you left out the political. You know, you can't do everything, so I'm not trying to really get on your case, right? Uh, you can, you do already really a lot, but somehow between the the economic and the civil, the political doesn't play a role. And yet, I think Orban is a wonderful, wonderful, can't stand the guy, but I think he's a brilliant political strategist. He's a brilliant political strategist who already uh, in 98 showed uh, that he was a brilliant political strategist. Uh, uh, to turn Fidesz into something on the uh, center right and then on the far right uh, was brilliantly successful for him. Uh, and so it's political. The phenomena, I think the political dimension of it uh, is a little bit missing in what your analysis is. And, and you know, people will think I'm really being unfair and I am because what you do is already so great, but that's a if we're going to talk about populism, in a way, the political meaning of it uh, should should play a role. Okay, I stop. I went on too long. Okay, let's listen to Mila Greskovic's answer to this comment. I would call it more yeah. comment than question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, of um, course. So, Andrew. Um, look, uh, the problem might be that I took seriously the title you gave me. So I thought, okay, you know, my research is elsewhere, but if you, if you ask me to talk about neoliberalism and economic uh, populism, I do my best to address, you know, supply means demand. Otherwise, I don't believe that actually economic populism exists in Hungary or East Central Europe in the form that it existed in Latin America only, but never really in East Central Europe. So, uh, I mean, what I try to manage is that, uh, or, or tell you that economic populism is surviving, yes, as a, an inf sort of a junior partner to neoliberalism, which still prevails, and it has its function within, but then one has to, doesn't have to make it too seriously. So to take it too seriously. Uh, and actually my entire work nowadays is pretty much in politics. But what I try to tell, precisely because so many people focus on elections and electoral behaviors and uh, electoral groups, that there is a civil society component to this. Now, how strong this generally is, I cannot tell 
before I have comparative uh, evidence. So for instance, I try to convince my friends in Poland. So why don't you do a similar research on uh, the Gazeta Polska circles, for instance, the local networks of populists, because this might be, this will be an important factor of, of resilience uh, if this happens, but I don't know. So I, I was very happy to read uh, the Scotch Paul Williamson book because they, they point to something similar in the US with the Tea, tea Party uh, story. So I felt okay, so I am not entirely alone. I tried to read about the Gulen movement uh, in Turkey and a number of other cases and situations, but I think that what populism is meant to be now is not necessarily because of what it is really re in reality, but what our theoretical or the currently fashionable theoretical lens shows about that subject. So here, here is where I see my place. So it's the whole issue of, uh, you know, this is a very rich material uh, what I have. And of course, most of it is about community building and civil society. And, uh, you know, I, uh, there is another part to it where the money comes from, but I, I don't really do research on that. I don't touch up on that topic. Uh, my, my evidence is not, not enough to see that, but I think it is politics. It is just mm -hmm. not electoral, it's civic politics. Now here, of course, I am fighting another problem uh, civil society. So often, if you look at them, these groups are not very civic because they are very hegemonic. They are exclusive. They are, you know, uh, they are not accepting. So, for instance, you could not found a civic circle if you were a gay. So that was missing uh, from the repertoire. Otherwise, yes, you you could be a far writer. You could be a an old-style social democrat, you could be a trade union member, you could be a conservative church-bound intellectual. Uh, yes, of course, uh, these, these, these have, you know, social conservatism does have an exclusionary aspect. At the same time, I have real trouble with out-defining church-bound organizations from civil society, even if they have an exclusive idea about uh, good words. So, um, but I actually, uh, I am very happy uh, with, with your comment. And I, you know, I am not really an economist in my current research. I am more a political ethnographer. And I came back to this economics topic because you wanted to hear about it. <laughs> the economic aspect. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you for your response. Um, the floor is open. I have questions, but uh, comments, but uh, I don't want to use my authority to monopolize the scene. Okay, I start my questions and then Maybe it will have an effect on. Um, so, as a sociologist, I, 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 I was listening your lecture a little bit differently than Andras did. Actually, Andras um, Orato, I think he is right that, uh, and the, 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 the dominant discourse on populism is connected to politics, but that, that's why the politics. The, 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 the social science approach of, on populism is a top-down approach because it comes from the politics. And your presentation was bottom-up. Bottom-up and uh, one of my most loved part of your presentation was uh, dealing with your research actually on and uh, using the term fork economy, fork economies. It's, I think it's an extremely important thing. Um, and uh, and then I, if I, let's say, if I not, no, I don't limit to the economic aspect 
of this folk economy, which is very, very important because the small entrepreneurs and they, they can have a, let's say, a relatively um, good business and make profits and uh, in the market they can, uh, the market is enforced by external influences, like it's not simply to buy a wine, but this is Hungarian wine and then, so that's why it led me to the the term what you discuss here that maybe the success of the Fides from a sociological point of view is embedded in the question of identity. So the neoliberalism, not necessarily the concept which can have a broad identity consequence. Of course, it has material consequence very strong, very effectively, but no identity. And, and the Fidesz actually, when it was in power in the first time, it was, it was connected to the time of the millennium. And it was not an accident that the Fidesz spent so much money to celebrate the 1,000 year old history of Hungary which, uh, which, which came together with a lot of uh, entertaining. I mean, the crown was sh shipped, you know, on the Danube and it was finally moved to the parliament and the liberals were very critical, necessarily, merely because this kind of nationalistic approach was very far from the liberal uh, way of thinking, but it was very successful. And but then you, your, your research proved that yes, yes, a lot of people uh, who, who found themselves in a, a new system and they were looking for identity, the Fidesz offered this identity, this kind of national identity. And, uh, and, and it's still, I think, even if the, the civic aspect of the, of the Fidesz the political identity is weaker, so they don't, don't so much rely on mobilizing the people because well, they think in a term of a complete nation and they want to mobilize the nation against the West, against the multinational companies, against the banks and such. Um, but still, I think that's, that is a heritage there's a heritage of the post-transition period that there was a vacuum, an identity vacuum, and the Fidesz, let's say very cleverly, or I don't know what, how could I uh, describe it, realize that there is an empty place where they can enter the people's life and where people can feel maybe better than without this kind of identity. What do you think about this? So, Antal, the, 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 these are the very questions that uh, actually occupy me. So, uh, so one question is, and precisely uh, what you say, uh, <clears throat> given the importance of identity after uh, 40 years or more of a regime in which left identities, old left identities got discredited, new left identities were not imported, national and religious identities and civic identities were suppressed, we have an open battlefield. Everything is uh, debated, everything is fought for. Now the question for me is, is it that the left and liberals lost out in this battle because the old left-wing ideas don't work anymore, the new left ideas could not take root because they are socially embedded, because the rainbow banner, now I, I use this you know, as an analogy for you know, our love of diversity. Uh, 
is not capable of creating encompassing communities because we are in love with our differences, precisely our lifestyle. So it's not so easy to figure out what brings together a vegan, let's say, uh, with a transsexual. So it's not, not obvious, you know. So is it that this is the problem? That, uh, that the left and liberal side, at least in the East, was never recreated and remained intellectually hollow and uninnovative? Or is this a global problem? Or is it the case that the ideas would have been there, but left and liberals in power were lazy and forget about, forgot about cultivating civil society, dealing with people on the ground and put too much faith in money and owing the media, which is of course a problem. You have a tremendous problem when a populist right-wing power occupies the media and has all the money. So you have to start then from the ground. Uh, is it that, um, you know, obviously, uh, rel as compared to this research, and a parallel research, research should be done, and I am not badly uh, uh, placed to do that research. Of course, there was a very strong international effort to create a left and liberal civil society, either based on private uh, donations, uh, George Soros and others, and the European Union. So what did, it, what did happen with that one? What did happen with the trade unions, originally bulwarks of workers' culture in the interwar period, but even to some extent in socialism? So do we see a worldwide phenomenon? Do we see uh, a Hungarian phenomenon? Did the left and liberals make a tremendous mistake, but is it because the ideas are followed or is it because the organization building uh, efforts uh, were too, too weak. So what I read in these materials uh, that I collected, that people felt tremendously gratified by being taken seriously. You know, they had often very naive small ideas, stupid small ideas, one would say, right? But we, we shouldn't tell this. Uh, and uh, Maybe the other side, uh, you know, but this is uh, probably banal what I am telling. So probably sh more should have been invested into, into taking seriously people's demand for basic communities. Of course, there is a lot of strategy there. So, and, and both of you told, yes, Orban is a good political strategist. Uh, but here somehow his his project from above met with mobilization from, from below. And I believe actually that even if the civic circles named like this don't exist anymore or lost their influence, you know, the civil society around uh, Christian churches national organizations, organizations of the nation exist. And they are not just uh, supported from above, which makes the whole thing, of course, much more efficient, uh, but they are also demanded uh, from below. And, and, you know, we may like or may not like it, you know, some of this stuff that I read is uh, not my cup of tea, obviously. Uh, but then uh, isn't it that, uh, you know, we, we should take seriously, even, even if we disagree. So, but what I am talking about is a nicer period of, <laughs> of Hungarian right-wing rule, or, or even right -wing, the right-wing project, right? Uh, so, of course, what happened then, this permanent escalation, uh, a political escalation uh, is still a, a very complex issue for me. Uh, 
And you know, I do this research because not many other people do it. It's extremely labor intensive. Uh, yeah, and it's part of the story. I think it is a very important part of the story. And I think uh, if I want to, to be such things to be done on the other half, on the, in the other camp, uh, you know, this, this is what they should do, apart from, you know, creating all kinds of electoral coalitions and party programs and so on. Uh, there are many more things to be done in order to, to turn the, the, the wave. That's another question. This is the problem of national bourgeoisie. Uh, paradoxically, the whole expression came back uh, in 2010 when the Fidesz entered to power and started to create a, a new regime. But in a very early moment in 1990, as I remember, Ivan Selenyi, a sociologist, a very well-known sociologist, wrote an article and emphasized the danger that without an, a national bourgeoisie, which, which, which emerged on the basis of the neoliberal system, economic system, the whole, the whole economic construction and the whole society is becoming completely uh, this, this stable, unstable because the foreign capital arrived, because if have to be talking about neoliberalism, of course, there's a free market, the free move of the capital, the national sector had to be privatized, who can buy it, the foreign companies, and I remember this is a very good article, actually, that he said that this, 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 the foreign capital is not a dangerous in a sense, but the problem is that they are not involved in the so social consequences of the privatization. So somehow the state must pay the cost, the social cost of the privatization of the Hungarian economy. But it happened. It happened and now it's not, it criticized by the way how it happened, that it's too fast and it was too, too much corrupt, but it was necessity. And then the Fidesz turned back to this question again and started to systematically, in a very corrupt way, using the state resources, financial resources, to create a new, a new bourgeoisie. And it has an effect on what you said, that it's a, it's a mixed system that partially, it, let's say, can be called as populist, partially as even neoliberal. I'm a little bit skeptical that the system right now is really neoliberal. So, because this effect that they are building a kind of oligarchic economic system is completely in conflict with the neoliberal principles because it's not a market. It's not, not connected to the free market philosophy. So, Let me so, register a, a problem to both the question and, uh, and uh, uh, Bela's perspective. I mean, the book occasionally refers to this formula TINA, T-I-N-A, there is no alternative. And uh, uh, what I, I, I don't hear from you, either in the book or in the article, uh, that there is any kind of alternative. This, I think, is, is the prison house that some of you fellow economists put us in. I would say Janos Kornoy being foremost among them. Now, very quick to yell autocracy, which is also not really entirely correct for such a uh, uh, such a system, but the idea that there is no alternative. And now you say, I think very, very interesting in this discussion with Tony, that any alternative would have to be able to uh, once again, take the civil seriously. By the way, I've been arguing that since 1990, that that was a disaster, what happened to that. And David O's too, by the way, so I was not the only one. But taking the civil seriously uh, is not yet the alternative, right? Because it only helps you win, but doesn't help you reconstruct and govern. 
So I, I think it's, it's important to, to kind of consider. Now, Joseph Biden shows that there is an alternative, right? But this is after COVID and in the United States, which is enormous, right? And so you can't say if Biden can do it, then Karachin can do it, let's say, just to mention a name in Hungary. It's uh, United States and Hungary are not the same, uh, right, uh, for obvious reasons. But nevertheless, I think it's time for, for us, and I completely agree with revitalizing civil society and doing everything in the way that you suggest uh, uh, they have done it, we have to do it differently and better. But uh, in the name of what? In the name of going back to, uh, uh, to something like Cornlight's text from 1990 about the alternative? I mean, uh, it was already scary to me then that he could write it. Although I agreed with the short term uh, role of radical marketization, but to, to some, simply come over to the perspective of capitalism, highly idealized, by the way, that doesn't exist anywhere. Uh, Tony mentioned, you know, that Hungarian capitalism is oligarchic. Well, I have news for you. So are all the others. So are all the others oligarchic in just in different ways. I think we need to kind of think about an alternative beyond. I'm not saying it was your job to do that today. But in any case, uh, uh, you know, uh, the civil society answer is part of the answer, but it is only a part. And uh, recovering some traditions which people feel strong about is also a part, but this is not yet a package, not a package for victory. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, ve very, very good questions, and, and, and thank you very much. So, I, I, I had actually an opinion about this national bourgeoisie story. I don't see the national bourgeoisie of the period between 1990 to 2006, 7, 8 as un oligarchic and fair. Yeah. I think it's. <laughs> It was built in a similar way. Now, I am not in the position corruption researchers would uh, swear that Fidesz is more corrupt. I can imagine it. Uh, it goes much more towards the, the family uh, enrichment and so on. But, uh, you know, I again have a problem. So, you know, the, how, many, how many decades and years do we have national bourgeoisies to become really competitive, non-corrupt, non-dependent on external funding. Uh, any international comparison would tell you that uh, capitalism is not nice when it starts, you know, uh, basically with its <laughs> original accumulation, right? So here I am, you know, I am not sure that we can uh, contrast uh, basically post-communist, socialist, power structure-based, quote-unquote, national bourgeoisie with that of the right wing as, you know, as, as, as non-corrupt. Uh, no, th there are proportions here and I, I would, would give in you know, if you sit on my back that, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe degrees of corruption matter uh, for how, how far a national bourgeoisie can be seen as an asset for the nation. Uh, now, uh, in the early times, of course, the idea was that if, uh, or the circles where I moved and, 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 and in sort of economic policy making advisors uh, among, uh, you know, the left and liberal circles, that if foreigners do things better, let them do. Yeah. Now, I, I think that's wrong, actually, because a society where all the important property positions are occupied by foreigners is pretty much a dystopia. Uh, it's a dystopic uh, society. So there should be, should be a need uh, for a national bourgeoisie. You know, Now, the, the, the interesting question is um, uh, also coming now to, 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 um, 
to Andra. So why, why build civil society and for what purpose? I think we need to make a step back and realize that it doesn't exist or we know very little about it. And I think that what Hungary also shows and not only Hungary is a, a sort of an atomization. So there is a demand for people to do their things on behalf of people to do their things, be it, you know, small local media, uh, coming together to discuss topics, uh, having lectures, uh, protesting for their views and so on and so forth. And civil society offers them this kind of arena. And then we will see. And then we will, we, I don't think that we can define the purpose. The purpose would be reviving a democracy, which is not based only on uh, you know, uh, media politics, which may be not based only for on the power of money, spin doctors, and so on and so forth, and find out what kind of organizations can be integrative here. So I, I have here important questions. Should the left and liberals form ideas about religion? What do we think about? Uh, should they should they think about uh, nation in different ways, uh, but still not agreeing that the European Union membership solves the national question. So I think that there is some need for, inter in, for intellectual innovation, and this would not work in a devastated landscape uh, in terms of you know, what people on the ground learn about politics and about uh, co-citizens. So if you want, Andras, my, my simple answer to your question, yes, civil society building for its own sake, for the time being, because we don't have what we, the, you know, the, the, the opposition to, to Hungarian right-wing power, uh, has a very long way to go, in my view. And I am not entirely sure how far and how, uh, you know, um, effectively, you know, opposition alliances, including uh, everybody and their grandmother, uh, you know, will help build an identity community apart from an electoral coalition and how this works out against uh, an, an enemy, an adversary, let's call it like this, um, without emotions, that is, in my view, better socially embedded. So, so yeah, I don't know whether this is, this is uh, satisfactory. I am not further uh, in my thinking. Okay, thank you very much. Well, it's not very Hello. optimistic. Hmm? <laughs> Agnes, this is your turn. Thank you. Thank you. I just recognize that I have uh, two questions. Uh, I uh, liked very much uh, that part of your presentation when you were speaking about uh, this kind of Janus face of uh, faces of uh, the politics, uh, making politics. And uh, one of them is the noisy uh, politics of populism and uh, the quiet politics of neoliberal continuity. And I think it is absolutely right. Uh, and of course, who live in Hungary experience this every day. And this is a very winning combo, as you mentioned as well. What I don't understand at this point is that and of course, and, and let me just uh, give that example. When you mentioned the quiet politics of neoliberalism, you mentioned uh, uh, the uh, withdrawal investment or reducing investment into healthcare, into social services, into education, and so on and so on. What I don't understand, and now comes what I don't understand, what I don't understand is that uh, 
you know, anywhere where I go, I experience very unsatisfied people, you know? So people on daily basis experience the insufficient working of these institutions, the deficiencies, the lack of resources, speaking about each higher education, uh, public education, healthcare, social care, and so on and so on. So, and there is this kind of noisy populist uh, voice, you know, of course, that is why it is so important to cover and expropriate the whole media front. But how people can fit together these two experiences, you know? I mean, they experience on a daily basis the negative effects of this uh, uh, urban politics, you know? And uh, how, how I, I just, uh, I mean, yeah. And really, if uh, I, sometimes I don't understand when I speak with people everywhere, I mean, in countryside, in shops, uh, in markets, in, you know, this kind of uh, craftsman's uh, discussions, uh, drivers, uh, I mean, everybody is incredibly, uh, incredibly unsatisfied and they have a lot of emotions against uh, the regime and they think it works uh, very, not very well and they are very much against it. So how, how these two things come together and how the system can be maintained on this kind of, uh, I mean, popular uh, experience. Yeah, I know, of course, uh, there is a certain part of certain part of society which uh, uh, support uh, the regime unconditionally. It's no question. Anything can happen. They vote for Fidesz. It's no question about that. But I do not think that this is the majority. This is mm -hmm. getting to be the majority, but. Maybe still not. And my, this is one of my questions. Uh, I try to be a little bit shorter the next. So my second question, I really, I mean, <laughs> that is a good uh, uh, English expression, you know, a nail was hitting my, my head or something like that, you know? So um, when you told, uh, when you were speaking about uh, this kind of uh, liberal, um, you, know, you know, the deficiencies or the, the faults, uh, or, uh, faults uh, uh, or the blind spots of uh, liberalism or liberals. Uh, and you were speaking about the wrong-headed emancipation. You remember? Which is a very important thing because you mentioned a lot of examples. One of them is, you know, I mean, the men and women and the different kind of subgroups in the society. And you told uh, these kind of uh, uh, wrong-headed emancipations uh, or emancipative uh, uh, strivings or, or projects undermined cohesion, social cohesion. Um, I was thinking about that. What is this wrong-headed emancipation? I mean, I don't know whether how emancipation can be wrong-headed at all. And I was thinking about that, you know, okay, uh, there is this kind of liberal identity politics issue, which was a little bit overdone, uh, which actually based on the individual uh, human rights, individual citizens' rights, and the recognition of difference. I mean, this is a very important thing. And this kind of recognition, a kind of respect inside the society I mean, we have a lot of small groups in the society actually uh, 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 um, somehow making communities around different kind of features, different kind of interests, different kind of identities, obviously. And I mean, we recognize each other, we respect each other, and this makes a kind of cohesion. And on the other hand, uh, later on, you mentioned there are these kind of church organizations, which part of the civil society and so on. And I'm really absolutely happy to recognize people's uh, right to their religion and setting up religious groups and church organizer, organizations and so on. Uh, so it is, it is not the problem at this point for me. 
The problem is that very bland, well-designed, and purposefully directed attack against, against those groups which try to which try to somehow be organized on the basis of alternative, I would say alternative in quotation, for what perspective alternative, of course, I think these are main rights. These are not alternative rights. I mean, these are alternative rights from the perspective of current mainstream ideology, which thinks that there is only, you know, this kind of the conservative ideology the, the religionism, the feminism, and so on. And from this perspective, maybe, for instance, uh, uh, women's rights or gender rights are alternative rights, but I don't think so, it is true. So I think this is a kind of uh, ideologically based, distorted and biased uh, way of building cohesion on the basis of national, nationalist con collectivism at the same time, this, which at the same time denies uh, the subgroups, the, the diversity of and the fragmentation of the society and try to reach a kind of homogeneous kind of society, which is not cohesion in my view. That is not cohesion. If a social group or if a political order try to homogenize society, that's not cohesion. Cohesion comes uh, bottom up, not from, you know, not top bottom. They, I'm sorry, I mean, this is, I, I just try to see a little bit more clear about this kind of wrong-headed emancipation issue. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. AI? Yes. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Agnes. Uh, very good question. So I start with the second. So this must have been a misunderstanding uh, that uh, liberal emancipation is uh, wrong-headed is not my view. This is a view which is part of the double attack of uh, against liberalism, right? So what I tried to tell that how I see the debate, there, there are basically combined attacks on cultural grounds and economic grounds. And then leaders, or political forces more generally, who combine these two have may have a winning formula. So I, I didn't mean that in my view, emancipation of women, uh, black people, immigrants, gays, and so on and so forth would be, uh, would have a disintegrative effect on society. This is not my view. I tried to present a view, right? So this is what I, I, I can tell about it. Yes, I agree with you that there is, there, there is a, a, a consciously designed strategy to actually deepen uh, these divides and these trenches within the Hungarian society. But what I try to argue uh, throughout this whole civil society research, that people are not born nationalist, religious, exclusive, hating others, accepting others, respecting diversity, uh, and so on. They are teaching each other and they are taught by their organizations and they are taught by the people who they accept as important sources of information and credible sources of information. And what the right did better in this respect is do the teaching business. What the left did in this respect was a loser strategy. I need to understand why this was the case, whether it is really not so easy to create a, a community that is tolerant, that is respecting diversity and so on and so forth, or whether you know, this was a, a business that, that was just not done. So it's a, so what I am saying is that the, that, that the battlefield was, was basically open. So they, people could have been turned into different in Hungary. So 
you know, if you want, this is sort of a plebeian attitude uh, of mine to people. I believe that uh, people can be turned uh, and they are ready to listen to things, not everybody, but you know, much more, many more than what we see in Hungary. And also maybe there is a naivety that I believe in education, but half of the literature about, you know, the silent revolution and some talks about uh, education. And it is not by chance that populist right-wingers also want to put their hand on education. It's crucial, you know, education writ large. So that, that's my, my uh, just my clarification. So I agree with you. It's not my point uh, uh, to, to tell that, uh, that this was wrong-headed emancipation. Now, the second issue, you see everywhere unsatisfied people. Uh, this might well be the case, and I have my own experiences. Now, the problem is that what we see from opinion polls is that that the governing party uh, still has uh, basically as much support as all the rest of uh, the opposition parties taken together. Nowadays, it looks, you know, this, this electoral coalition, whether it will come true, has something more, but still this is remarkable. And of course, one can explain it in many ways why this is the case, but, uh, uh, you know, partly repressive measures, partly media monopoly, and so on and so forth. We can read a lot about it. I think there is also still a civil society um, component behind it. And part of the story might be that there is a large number of people who would wait for a better offer, um, a better alternative. And so this is then not about, not the research about Fides, but about what the opposition can offer. And here, I mean, we see what it can offer. It's not entirely clear yet what it can offer. Uh, uh, so, you know, it has a supply side and a demand side uh, element. And it, it, it has an element that, uh, that can be basically studied by studying Fides, and it can be mm, another element that cannot be mm, understood, studied by merely studying Fides. Um, Again, Andra should say it's not too optimistic. Yeah, <laughs> I am, I am, I am not really. Education take very long. I know. But, you know, my problem is that necessity doesn't create possibility, to be simple. So if this is the job, then yes, there was a period when there was a better uh, opportunity for, you know, fighting this, this battle. And, and you know, the, the whole story is extremely complex because what we don't know even, and, and, and I have suspicion, this is not just a Hungarian story. I think this this is not just a Hungarian story. I mean, the U.S. I look at the U.S. I mean, there was also a very, very difficult uh, situation from the viewpoint of the liberals. Uh, I look at other countries, uh, including uh, Italy or Poland or uh, France, even. So this is a, a a big battle which is going on, and it is both cultural and economic. So it is, it's no joke. Uh, so, you know, when, when we see that, uh, that people argue that, yes, this, this, it's, it's a very, very sharp thing. So what is happening is, yeah, because of, of, of views and, and, and power, economic and, and non-economic power. So, um, Uh, we are running out of time. I have one more. Sorry, I, I haven't answered the question about alternatives. I can uh, can can answer very quickly. This we wrote uh, in our book about diversity of uh, capitalism in Europe's periphery about the alternatives. So countries did not follow the same uh, directions. There was Slovenia, which had a relatively 
socially balanced neo-corporatist transformation strategy. There was the Baltic way where pure neoliberal economics was married with uh, nationalism in political uh, uh, respects. Uh, and there were the Visegrad countries where neoliberalism was more or less uh, combined with in an instable, fragile balance with relatively socially sensitive welfare arrangements. So there were uh, originally alternatives. And if we want to learn about alternatives nowadays, probably we should take a second look at what happened to those alternatives. Are, are, the, are now all the countries the same or not? But uh, these are or were that time alternatives within neoliberalism. Nowadays, the question is more open because the world has changed or is changing. So the hegemony is challenged, at least, we can say. Well, it is certainly challenged in the United States. And, uh, uh, and I think that for you, more important will be Germany and France and Scandinavia. If it gets to be challenged there, the chances of alternatives in Hungary too will, will increase. To do uh, a, the good thing in one Hungary alone is, is a questionable proposition, right? But uh, lots depends on Berlin and lots yeah. depends on, on, uh, on whom Berlin can mobilize against any alternative, which it is still likely to do. So really, yeah. you have to win a German election first before we can talk about the alternative in Hungary. Yes. I'm... Yeah, I agree. OK, I must tell the audience that we are talking talk, talk, talk so much about Hungary, but Hungary is like a, a, a case study. So it's not really we talk about Hungary, but a very special situation, but uh, uh, race such questions which are globally relevant. So it's not simply a Hungarian uh, or American, the US uh, uh, issue, but it's much, much more serious. These questions are much more serious because they are- No, it was a wonderful, wonderful presentation and I see its application in lots of places, but certainly the United States. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for the lecture. Thank you. And, uh, Great the discussion because the discussion was also excellent and we learned a lot. Well, and thank you so much for joining us. And the next week, uh, the audience is is waited and they are welcome because we are talking about the populism and the welfare state. I think which logical uh, next step. Next step, yes, the economy and the welfare state. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much again for the opportunity. I, I really enjoyed thinking about these things. So thank you for the inspiration and the questions.